This is the story of three disturbing encounters with the same man. Let's not make it four. I was 15 years old at the time, and out to a weekend afternoon movie with my friend. We were really early, so we decided to take a look around at a nearby toy store just to kill time before the previews began. I was strolling absentmindedly down an aisle by myself, looking at toys I felt far too old for when I heard an odd whistle. If you've ever heard the iPhone notification chime, then you have an idea of the sound that I heard. I thought nothing of it. Maybe it was someone's phone and moved through the aisles, eventually meeting back up front with my friend. We walked around a bit more, talking and laughing. I heard that whistle once more. Being preoccupied with my conversation more than anything, I still didn't pay it any mind. On our way out of the store, I heard that whistle for a third time, but much closer, practically right over my shoulder, and I whipped around mid-sentence. A man stood there, grinning from ear to ear in a strangely sinister way. The smile didn't fully reach his eyes. He was a bit on the small side, scraggly with long hair tied back in a low ponytail. He had a tattered black t-shirt on, which hung loosely off his thin frame, and a bulging black drawstring backpack. Hi, he said, stretching his lips even wider around his bright white teeth. As a teenage girl, I was no stranger to the attention of an older man. But something about his persona and approach set me on edge. Still, I was taught to be polite. Hi, I responded tentatively, taking a step backward and away from his intense stare. I've noticed you around the store and thought I could get your opinion on something. He unfurls a crumple, stained copy of the Toy Store Weekly ad, and pointedly stabbed at the Barbie doll selection with his index finger. See, I'm looking for the perfect doll for my niece and just have no idea which one to pick. What do you think? He looks up and smiles, but his eyes are dark pools of nothingness, devoid of any real interest. This one is nice, I say, pointing to a doll at random, hardly even looking at the ad. Wow, thank you. I really appreciate that. Hey, has anyone ever told you how pretty you are? You must go to the gym often. What gym do you go to? Taken aback by his abrupt stream of rehearsed sounding pickup lines, I say thank you and force a laugh. I'm young and so is my friend. Our inexperience and his strange approach keeps us frozen in place. His eyes continue to bore into mine and that wide smile never faded from his face. Hey, do you want to be friends? I'd like very much to be friends with you. You know what friends do? They take pictures together. Let's take a picture together since we're new friends. He holds up a red flip phone with the front cover held together by a rubber band. He activates the front facing camera and before I could say anything, he leans into me, face uncomfortably close, and snaps a picture. He looks at her briefly, smiles, and then pockets his phone. There, now we're friends, he says matter-of-factly, and turns his gaze back to me, appraisingly. Stupidly in a horrified daze, I nod. So, where are you from? Where are you going after this? What do you like to do? My friend puts her hand on my arm, and I suddenly break from my stupor. We have to go, my dad's waiting, I say, and we turn to go. My last, but not final glimpse of him is with his head cocked to the side and that wide smile spread across his face. His eyes now flicker with something I can only recall as amusement. We turn our backs and as soon as we get far enough away, we run. Fast forward to a year and a half later, I'm in my junior year of high school and on the early morning city bus heading to my first class of the day. The bus is packed and I squeeze my way to the back reaching in a hand to grab the pole as the bus breaks sharply. I hear a whistle close to my ear. When I hear it again, just my earbuds in my ear. Why isn't that person answering their phone? A hand closes right above mine on the pole. It is too close, and our fingers brush, but the person holds their hand there, almost intentionally. I move my hand and glance up, and into the broad smile of the creepy man from that toy store cold chills shoot down my spine, and I grip the pole even harder until my knuckles turn white. He tilts his head, still smiling that toothy grin, and says, Hi, friend. This bus is so jam-packed that there's nowhere else for me to go, so I turn my body as far away from him as possible, 
hoping that playing dumb would work in my favor and he would go away. He leans closer still and says, Hi, do you remember me? I shake my head no and lean as far away as I can in that tight space. He frowns and looks suddenly angry. No, I know you. We met before. We're friends. I shake my head again, looking down, pretending to be engrossed in my music player. Maybe if he didn't get a full look at my face, he might think he had me confused with someone else. No, I have your picture, he says. Reaches into his drawstring bag, pulls out his red flip phone held together by frayed rubber bands. All the while I'm thinking, if he sees me get off at the stop to my school, he'll know where I am every day. He could find me easily. But if I get off at a random stop before my school, he could get off with me, and I'd have nowhere else to go. He's still scrolling through his phone, and I'm imagining all the other girls' pictures he might have had on there when he asks, So, what school do you go to? I think about saying mind your own business, but remember his angry frown from before, and give him the name of another school. It doesn't really make sense because this bus only goes past one high school, and not the one I told him, but he nods at this and says, Hold on. I have your picture here somewhere. We're friends. The bus pulls up to my high school, and there's nothing else I can do but get off. While he's preoccupied with his phone, I lose myself in the crowd and run all the way to school. I'm shivering when I get to my first period classroom, and all I can hear is the blood rushing in my ears. I ask my boyfriend to take the bus with me every morning for the next few weeks, and I change up my route going to and from, but I don't see him again. That is until two years later, and I'm a sophomore in college, taking the bus home alone after a late night out with friends, when I hear a weird whistle. Enough time has passed that I don't feel much alarm, and exit the bus at my stop. It is completely dark out, and I'm one of the only two people who got off. Then from behind me I hear, Hello there, do you remember me? I turn around. It's him again. It's hard to make out his features in the dark, but I instantly remember the tone of his voice, recall the whistle, and the tilted head, and that same wide, toothy smile. I see what looks like a backpack strapped to the front of his chest. No, I say, and I start walking faster, heart racing and wondering how fast I can keep up in these flip flops. I hear him picking up speed behind me, and I dare to glance back. I catch a glimpse of him starting to run at me his hands in his backpack, digging around for something that I don't want to know what it is. He's angry now, smile gone. He shouts at me. So you want to be that way, huh? I start running and don't stop until I get home. So, to the whistling man with the backpack, no, I do not want to be your friend. Let's never meet again. I live on a 13-acre property in an area of my state where the suburbs turn to rural farmland. My parents live in the main house near our road, while my fiancé and I converted one of the barns on the back half of the property into our house. Our house and another barn are set in a pretty wide clearing pasture, but beyond that we're surrounded by woods on three sides. All of this to say, we don't get many visitors out here. From the time we moved into the house almost a year ago, there have been some occasions where I get this inexplicable feeling of terror while outside at night. I've lived in the woods my whole life, including in places far, far more remote than here, but I've never had this feeling. The woods are home, and every other place I've lived they've felt like my woods, but not here. I've repeatedly had the feeling that I'm trespassing on someone else's land. Someone who's not happy to have me here. The other night I took my dog out for his last walk. It was around 11 p.m., so it was pitch black outside the ring of light cast by the floodlights on the side of the house. As I was walking toward the edge of the tree line where my pup likes to do his business, I heard a sound like someone imitating the hoot of an owl coming from the direction of the other barn about 
30 yards away, to our right. I was so certain that it was a human making that noise I called out. Uh Uh-huh. Very funny, Dad. I assumed it was my father closing up the barn for the night, and he was taking this opportunity to try to spook me. No one called back. It was at this point that my dog lifted his head from sniffing all over and froze, staring in the direction of the barn. His hair stood up along his spine, and he started to give a low, menacing growl. Now this dog is obsessed with all people and animals. Everyone is a friend waiting to be made. I've never seen him act aggressively towards anything, even other dogs that have tried to fight him. My dad, in particular, is his favorite person on the planet, so there's no way he would have started growling at him. It was my turn for all the hair on my neck to stand up as a cold wave of fear hit me like a brick. My dog had stopped right at the edge of where the light met the darkness of the woods. Normally, the light gradually dissipated into the trees, still providing enough visibility to see the outline of the trees and shrubs, but this time... It ended with a solid wall of black. Suddenly, I heard the same fake owl sound from only a few feet away, just on the other side of the darkness. My dog jumped and immediately started barking, putting himself between me and the sound. He's only a little guy, so I darted forward, scooped him up, and took off running toward the house. Behind me, I heard the sound again. But this time it had a strange warble to it, almost like laughter. The next morning when I went out to check the barn, I found that the doors had been partially broken off the side and were swung past each other in the wrong direction, like someone had tried to force them open the wrong way. There were no signs of footprints in the sawdust or dirt or any other signs of an intruder. I have no idea what was out there that night. But suffice to say, my dog and I stay well within the floodlights when we go out after dark now. I just came across this sub and figured this story was perfect to share here. I shared it in Our Scary Stories two years ago, not realizing that that sub was mainly for, like, fictional spooks, but I promise you guys, this is 100% real and still gives me nightmares four years later. When I was 18, I worked at my college's residence building at the front desk, and I think I almost got assaulted or murdered. You be the judge. During the summer, the building operated as a hotel, so two and a half floors were hotel rooms and half of the third floor were student rooms. The whole building operated with a hotel swipe key system that was pretty outdated, and all the doors were powered by four AA batteries. If the batteries died, there was a decently lengthy process to replace them and reprogram the door. A dark-haired guy came to the front desk from inside the building while I was working an overnight shift at around 1 or 2 a.m. and said he left his key card in his room. I made him a new one and made my first error of the night. Hotel guests could have as many room keys remade as they wanted, hypothetically. Students, however, were supposed to be given a temporary key card and charged $2 to be returned when theirs is located. I gave him a new key for his room and asked if he was a student or a hotel guest, then he replied, student. At this point, I should have checked our system to charge his account, but I was caught up doing administrative duties and I just forgot. I used to trust people way too easily at this job and quickly I learned not to. Later on in the night, maybe around 3 or 4 a.m., he came to the desk again and said he couldn't get into his room. I asked if he just forgot his key again and he said no, the door wasn't working. I asked if the light was coming on when he swiped his card and he said no, so I figured the batteries were dead. I told him I'd have to charge the batteries and I went up to his room with him. He asked me for my name and I told him, but he didn't mention his. 
I opened the door manually with a master key and told him I'd have to prop it open while I worked on the back panel to replace the batteries. He said, no, it's okay, I'll close it, and closed and deadbolted the door locked. Really effing weird. But I tried not to think about it. I had changed the batteries on plenty of other doors by this point and some students were iffy about having their doors propped open for their room to be on display for just anyone walking by. He also had a really thick accent and I thought he might be an international student since we had a lot of students from other countries where English was not their first language. I gave him the benefit of the doubt and thought maybe it was also just a language barrier issue. At this point though, I really felt like something was wrong, but I tried to ignore it so I didn't freak him out. While I was trying to focus on fixing the door as quickly as possible, he kept trying to entice me to go further into the room, saying his bed was broken and he needed me to look at it, there was something underneath it that needed to be fixed, etc. He held out a little gold house key and said, I have a key, go get it and then threw it under the bed. He said there was a leak under the fridge. He just kept trying to get me to go down on the ground, throwing random problems at me. Obviously, I told him no. I'd send maintenance up in the morning to take a look at it if anything was broken. I had my back to him and he asked me if I would take off my glasses. I said, no, I need them to see. His tone of voice changed and in the most steady, chilling manner, he said, Ella, it's okay. You can take them off. And from behind me, he reached around and tried to take off my glasses. I swatted his hand away and trying to remain composed, I said, no thanks, I need to keep them on. Even though he was creeping me the F out, I didn't want to be rude to him. I didn't want to get in trouble if he complained about me or risk upsetting him and having him yell at me. I got up to grab something from the door repair kit and undid the door deadbolt and opened it up in the process. He jumped toward the door to close it again and told me to keep it closed. I told him no and I had to open it to start reprogramming it from the front. While I held the door open with my foot and grabbed something from the door repair kit, he started playing with the little wispy hairs at the top of my forehead and trying to touch my shoulder. I swatted him away again, asked him not to touch me, and I focused on getting the F out of there. He once again tried getting me to follow him into the bedroom, saying his bed was broken, and I went as far as the door frame to see if I could spot any actual problem with his bed. This is when I realized that he had nothing in his room. No dishes in the kitchen, no shower curtains in the bathroom, no sheets on the bed. There was nothing. This wasn't his room. My brain once again went back to the international student theory thinking he had just arrived today and maybe hadn't gotten a chance to buy anything yet, but in the pit of my stomach, I knew something was wrong. I fiddled around with the door for a few more seconds before announcing that it was fixed and I quickly gathered the door kit and I left. Before I had reached the elevator, he came back out without his shoes on to follow me. He tried to get back into his shoes and called out, Ella, the door isn't fixed, you, you need to come back. I went back and opened the door manually. I told him if the door was broken, I'd have to send up maintenance to fix it in the morning. I knew he was going to follow me to the elevator again, so I closed the door behind me once he went inside and ran down the stairwell as fast as I could. When I got to the front desk, I checked the computer and saw that the room he was in was supposed to be empty. It wasn't a student room or a hotel room. I locked myself in our back office and I called campus security. He came down a few minutes later and went behind the desk. I yelled at him to get on the other side and wait now that I knew he wasn't a resident. He tore the corner off of a slip of paper I had sitting on the desk and drew a flower on it and then put it back on top of my papers. 
When security arrived, he ran back up to the empty room and tried convincing them he lived there so he wouldn't have to leave. He kept showing them his key, which had decided to work on the door again somehow. They escorted him back downstairs and came to ask me if he really did live there. Obviously, he did not, and that's why I called you guys crying and terrified, right? He kept interjecting to argue that he did live there, but couldn't even recall his room number when he was asked. Security asked him for his student card and he couldn't produce one, so they told him he would have to leave if he couldn't prove that he actually lived there. While they were grabbing his information, I listened from the office and could immediately tell he was lying. The phone number he gave was just a bunch of random numbers. The name he gave was prefixed by, um, as if he was trying to think of a name. When they asked him for his address, he just said, across the street. One security guard asked if he lived in the apartments across the street and he said yes, but he couldn't tell them what the building number was. He said his apartment number was 1200, but I moved into that building a few months later and apartment 1200 doesn't exist. When security asked what his purpose was to be sneaking into a room, he just kept up the ums and ahs and saying he didn't know. They'd ask, were you trying to see a friend? Do you know anybody who lives here? Were you here to hurt somebody? And he kept fidgeting and saying, I don't know, no reason, I, I was just here. At one point, he tried to tell them that he was my friend, at which point I poked my head out of the office door to say that I literally have never seen him before that night. He left. We didn't call the police because he didn't actually do anything, but it was still so unsettling. Later on, it dawned on me how he figured out that that room was vacant. One of the housekeepers had been using it as her personal break room. A few days later, a housekeeper came to the desk and told me that they found the door deadbolted open, the TV on, and a housekeeper inside watching TV. She must have forgotten to close the door when she left for the night, and when the creep let himself into the building, he found it. I never saw him again, and to this day, I have no clue what he was doing there. I haven't worked there since last winter, and overnight shifts still give me the heebie-jeebies. Sorry for the long post. This happened tonight, just getting it off my chest. Was driving home from work and decided I wanted a pizza. Pulled into a pizza shop near home. Saturday night and it's pretty busy. It's staffed by three young girls. When I say young girls, I'm talking like teenagers. I don't know how it is elsewhere in the world, but working at a pizza shop here in Australia is very much a get paid cash after school type of job. As I'm ordering, the girl taking the order is super distracted, like she's looking past me at something. Then, as I'm trying to pay, she yells out to the two other girls prepping and cooking something like, Oh, thank God, Matt is back. Pseudonym for internet reasons and because I don't remember the name she said. As she said that, a delivery boy walked into the store, but pretty much came in and straight away did a 180 turn, taking more pizzas and leaving. I pay and turn to sit and wait, and that's when I see what the girl had been looking at behind me. Standing next to the entry door, peering through the shop face window, is a visibly terrifying man. He was about 5'8", in his late 20s or early 30s, rat-like pudgy, unnaturally pale with dark spots under his eyelids, long and greasy dark hair, and sharp-looking, almost cylindrical teeth. Weirdly, I thought, huh. Maybe that's her mate. Obviously, I got bad vibes, but my initial reaction was just confusion at the sight of him. Anyway, another guy comes in to pick up some pizzas, pretty much right as I sit down and the girl freezes while serving him too. But this time, she apologizes and says something like, Sorry, I'm a bit distracted because this guy won't stop coming to my work and staring at me through the window. My boss bans him here, but he comes back when he's gone. 
I take a proper look at the window guy now, and he's like pointing at her, and waving and making other weird gestures. This instantly made me very uncomfortable, so without really thinking, I went outside and confronted the guy about what he was doing. I had a fair bit of adrenaline, and I don't really remember what I said, but it was like, you have to leave, you're scaring the workers. He just stared at me and did this weird wheeze in exasperation, like a dismissive wheeze. Then, through a wheezy voice, he said, I'm not doing anything. I said, you're being a creep and you're banned, get out of here. Then went back in, the creep walked off, and I thought it was solved. The girl thanked me and asked what he said. I said he didn't really say anything and she explained the things she had to the other guy before and also said he had said some really inappropriate and gross things to her. Just as I'm sitting back down, the guy comes in with a bank card in his hand. I said, what did I just tell you? Get out of here. But he makes a beeline straight to the counter and orders a pizza. The girl froze up, and I could tell she made the choice to put through his order because she was scared of how he would react if she didn't. Then he came and sat right next to me and said, See, if she didn't want me here, she wouldn't have let me get a pizza. It gets a bit hazy for me here because this is where the trauma happened, but I'm pretty sure I told him he was disgusting. Then he got really angry. He stood up, bent forward towards me, and was screaming. I haven't done anything wrong. What did I do? I'm a good boy. I've got a good heart. Tell me. Tell me. What did I do? How would you feel if someone said stuff like that about you? And it's whack, because even though I saw exactly what he had been doing and the effect it had on the teenage girl at the counter, I felt like I was wrong for telling him to stop. He was right up close to me now and yelling. He was fully raging out and I wasn't sure what he was going to do next. So I just kept my eyes locked on his and tried to look like I wasn't afraid of him and anticipate any incoming act of violence. He was just shrieking and screaming. Then the eldest of the workers came out from the kitchen and said, Stop yelling. If you're going to yell, you have to leave. And he did stop yelling. His whole demeanor changed. Now he was kind of jovial and conciliatory. He put his fist out to fist bump me, and he's going, You're a good guy, I can tell, or something like that. I wouldn't fist bump him and he sat back down. Now he was just talking to me, blabbering and shit. I wasn't really listening and told him I didn't want to talk. The girl he had been targeting was just staring, making these big, freaked out eyes. They fast-tracked his pizza and tried to send him on his way, and out the front, he started talking to this really big guy and was pointing at me through the window. I spoke to the girl and she thanked me profusely, even though I didn't really do anything. I actually felt like I made it worse, and she said she gets really freaked out because he comes by when none of the male workers are at the shop. She also said the guy had found her on Facebook and had been sending her creepy messages. I told her to make sure her parents knew about this and to tell the police. It turns out, the big guy at the front was the owner. The girl had called him and he'd come back to the store. He finished talking to the guy and came back in behind the counter, and afterwards the creeper let out the longest, guttural and rage-filled scream, guessing his ban had been re-explained to him. I genuinely worry that maybe the workers weren't taking this guy's behavior and fixation on a teenage girl as the dangerous threat it is. He was unreasonable and irrational and just all around the scariest person I've encountered for a while. He just had this bad energy to him, this sort of juvenile malignancy. Who knows what he's capable of. In February of last year, me and a bunch of my friends went camping at Moss Park, a county park to the southeast of Orlando. This county park is on a forested island with two large lakes to the east and west, and two extensive nature preserves to the north and south. We were just hanging around the campfire drinking beers and smoking pot. Around 11 p.m., me and three of the friends decided to go for a walk into the nature preserve to the south. Our destination was a dock on a pond slash cove of the large lake to the west. I normally am not the type to go walking outside in the woods at dark, 
I do a lot of hiking, but always during the daytime hours. I guess being slightly inebriated and with some friends made me feel braver than usual. So we went trekking off into the woods in the dark with nothing but a flashlight to protect us. At first, the trail was taking us through a large swamp, and nothing felt out of the ordinary. Next, the trail entered a thick pine forest. Here, things began to feel a bit different, and in retrospect, it was very quiet, but I wasn't concerned at the time. We got to the dock and started shining the flashlight around hoping to see some alligators. There were no alligators, no bugs, and no signs of life in general. I thought it was a bit odd, but again, I wasn't too concerned. Then all of a sudden, something changed. Within a few seconds, all four of us said something along the lines of, Do you feel that? Something all of a sudden felt very wrong. Then one of my friends said, Listen to how quiet it is. We all shut up and listened. It was insanely quiet. Not a single frog, insect, or bird. Even the wind had stopped. It was the quietest thing I had ever heard in my life. It was like we were inside of a vacuum. Remembering this lack of sound gives me chills to this day. Next, we all remarked how cold it was getting. I started getting goosebumps. It felt like the barometric pressure had just plummeted. At this point, we all agreed that we needed to get the F out of there. There was a strong feeling of impending danger, like something wanted us to leave ASAP, and we would be in big trouble if we didn't. I was able to feel that all of this energy was coming from across the pond towards us. I think all of my friends could feel this as well because we were all focused on the pond. Nobody was paying any attention to the dark woods behind us. It felt like a charge of energy was running through my body and I could feel exactly the direction that this energy was coming from. We all agreed that we had to leave and started walking back at a fast pace. The bad feelings were still present while we were walking back through the pine forest. One of my friends actually started crying. I wasn't too worried though. It felt like we would be okay as long as we kept walking. Once the trail exited the pine forest and into the swamp, all the bad feelings were immediately lifted. It was like we had crossed some sort of threshold and everything felt fine again. I think we may have been run off by a Sasquatch, because I've seen them myself on a few occasions, and I've heard that they can put these bad feelings into people. But we didn't see anything, so I can't say for sure what it was. About 15 minutes after getting back to the campfire where the rest of our friends were, we heard what sounded like someone or something whacking a tree with a big stick one time just across the campground. This may have been related to what happened earlier. The campground host immediately got up and started walking around with a light, as if they were equally surprised by this sound, or possibly this kind of thing had happened before. I had to leave the next morning to go to work but some of my friends stuck around and went back to the dock during the daylight hours, and they reported that nothing was out of the ordinary this next time. I still go hiking a lot, but I'm not planning on doing any more hiking in the dark. I felt like we were in legitimate danger, like whatever it was could have made us disappear if we didn't leave as soon as we did. I think my imaginary friend was a demon. When I was small, I had a friend named Emily that lived in my closet. She wore a white dress, had long black hair and a red ribbon. She always had her back to me and we would play and talk. My Nana mentioned hearing me and other voices when I would play with Barbies and she would come in and I would be alone to her, but Emily would be there with me. My grandma just assumed I was doing a funny voice. There was a time when I went down the street to another friend's house and watched Emily push the friend off the swing. The friend sprained her wrist. I kept saying it wasn't me, that it was Emily. The friend's parents were very unhappy and Nana said I was a liar. I told Emily that I was too old for imaginary friends. Nana said so, and she didn't like that. I would wake up on multiple occasions being pulled out of my bed by something holding my ankle, and the foot of my bed faced the closet. One night I finally saw her face. She didn't have any eyes, they looked gouged out, and her mouth was sewn shut. 
I still to this day cannot sleep with my closet door open. I've also seen her in a few other houses, not just my Nana's. I spend from age 12 to 18 permanently in foster care. That's a whole other story. In my junior year, I had finally been moved into my own bedroom. We were painting the walls and for some reason the closet walls too. There were no small children in the house. We were all middle and high school aged. When I came home from school, I felt really sick walking into my room. On the mirror, it looked like someone had just blown their breath on it and wrote, I can't eat. There were child-sized handprints inside the closet that were physically impossible compared to everyone else's in the house. My foster mother also felt that something was wrong when she walked in my room, and being a devout Christian, she punished me by calling me a Satanist and took away all non-Christian music. Thanks, Mom. No matter how much I tried to clean the mirror, that spot never went away. I could breathe on it, and the words would still be there. So I covered that part of the mirror up with pictures. Over the rest of the time there, I would wake up occasionally with scratches all over me. She assumed I was doing it to myself, which always made me feel worse. Shortly before I graduated, her biological son, a sophomore at the time, was woken up to a girl in a white dress with long black hair and a red ribbon. She was standing next to his bed. I'd never told anyone in the house what Emily looked like. I thankfully haven't seen her since my early 20s, but the trauma still remains. I'm still afraid of the dark. I'm still afraid of closets. I'm pretty sure she wasn't a ghost, but something far worse. The last thing I'll say on this, because I don't feel the need to pour out my entire traumatized childhood, is that you can believe what you want. Sure, there's movies out there about certain things, but that doesn't make my experiences any less real. It doesn't make the scars on my back and legs any less real. It doesn't make the fear I still feel walking through a dark house any less real. This all happened when I was 19. I'm not the best looking dude, so I've never had much luck with women and I ended up on Tinder. I wasn't having much luck there either, until the third month of using it, when a blonde woman named Katie messaged me. She was pretty enough that I just dismissed her as a bot. It wasn't until three days later that she messaged me again, which was odd because bots almost never message more than once. I clicked on her chat and replied, then looked at her profile. What I saw was pretty generic, but definitely wasn't a bot's profile. We had been talking for like a month when she proposed the idea that I come see her. I was pretty reluctant as she lived nearly eight hours from me by car, but I had to admit I really liked her quite a bit and I had been thinking about asking if I could come see her for a while now. After a bit more badgering from her, I finally said I would take the drive to go see her. At this point, I had no reason to doubt she was who she said she was. We had video chatted every other week and called most days. I just assumed I got really lucky. Things did get a little weird on the way there though. She kept messaging me, asking me where I was and making sure I was still coming. At some points, when I took more than 30 minutes to respond, she sent me a slew of annoyed texts. Admittedly, I had chalked this all up to her being nervous about me coming to see her. I was pretty nervous too, so I couldn't blame her. I had a hard time finding the house at first. The directions she gave me were pretty confusing, and it was back through a series of gravel and dirt roads, and a large thicket of trees. It was still about midday when I came onto an old looking house. It was her grandparents house and they left it to her in their will. She made decent money as a graphic designer so she was able to afford it. A window on the second floor was boarded up but it didn't look abandoned, just worse for wear. Katie's red buggy that she liked to talk about was parked in front of the garage. 
I took a look at my phone and texted her that I was here. She only sent a smiley face in return. When I got out of my car to go knock on the door, I noticed someone was looking at me from one of the second floor windows. I found it a little creepy, but figured it was just her father or something. She had told me that he comes to stay with her every now and again, so I ignored it and knocked on her door. She answered with a smile and gave me a kiss, which surprised me and I followed her inside. We sat down on her couch and started talking about our plans when I asked her about her dad. You didn't tell me your dad was here, I said. Was that going to be a surprise or... Katie looked confused and told me her dad wasn't there. I still thought she was keeping up the act and I told her that she didn't have to keep pretending and that I had seen him looking at me through the upstairs window. Katie went pale and said that we had to get out of there now. We both ran out to our cars and when I questioned Katie, she informed me that her dad wasn't there and that she had been home alone until I showed up. I called the police and while I was on the phone giving the address, Katie gasped and pointed to the window where I had seen the guy last. He was looking at us from the window again. I got a better look at him and he seemed older and frail, almost like he hadn't eaten anything in a while. He left the window after he saw that we saw him. The police took half an hour to show up and the whole time Katie was crying and mumbling about how she was an idiot for not keeping her doors locked. When the police finally did show up, one started asking me and Katie questions and the other two searched the house. They came back out a little later and told me and Katie that while they didn't find anyone, they did find that the back door was hanging open. Whoever it was ran out into the woods but the cops were sure the house was empty. After the cops left, Katie asked me to stay the night because she was too scared to be in her house alone right now. I gladly did and we slept downstairs on the couch as Katie's bedroom was the one next to the room the man was seen in. Katie had also brought out the shotgun that her father had given her but she had never used. I told her it was fine, the man's gone but she insisted, saying she'd feel safer if we had it out. I'm glad she did. Later that night, I was still wide awake watching TV. Katie had somehow managed to fall asleep. From the kitchen, I heard the sound of a doorknob being turned. At this point, I wasn't even scared, I was just pissed. I flipped on the light in the kitchen and pointed the gun at the kitchen door. And there he was. The guy that had been in the house before was standing on the other side of the glass door. He was so shocked and I'm glad we had locked the door. The man unfroze and yet again ran into the woods. I woke up Katie and told her what had happened and called the police again. When they arrived, they did a sweep of the woods and yet again found no one. They told Katie and me that it'd probably be a good idea to stay somewhere else for the night. Me and Katie said our goodbyes. She was going to stay at her friend's house and I was going home. I left a little after Katie did. I was on the phone with my brother telling him about what happened. My headlights were on. As I was talking, something caught my eye. That man was standing at the corner of the house just watching me. I gunned it out of there and didn't even bother calling the police again. But I did text Katie and she said she was going to call them again. I don't think Katie ever even went back to that house alone. She always brought a friend with her and ended up leaving a lot of stuff behind because she couldn't bear being there. We went on a few dates after but it didn't really work out. I feel like she associated me with that event and couldn't get past it. We still talk every now and again.
When I was about 21 years old, I served tables at a pizza chain restaurant in the evenings and the weekends. It was at a new shopping center near where I lived. It was a part-time job for me. I was opening staff at this brand new place and it was very popular at the time. There were several shifts of employees and a few trainers that came from other locations nearby and stayed to work at the brand new location. One of these cooks' name was John. He was only a couple years older than me. He was a kitchen manager or similar. And when I would forget to ring something in or make a mistake and he was working, I'd go back to the kitchen and tell him and he would often help me or give me extra sauce or whatever. And usually he was doing inventory or paperwork type stuff like food temp checks, etc. He was really nice to me. Never raised his voice or got mad. He was really a soft-spoken, quiet guy. I was engaged at the time and there was no flirting or anything. He was quiet, didn't seem interested in me like that or whatever. Just did his job and we'd briefly chat when we worked the same schedule. I quit about four or five months after opening the restaurant and didn't stay in contact with most of the staff, including him. Well, fast forward about a month or two after I quit and I was reading a news article, and the name in the article was the same name as the guy I had worked with. And he had starved his stepson to death and kept him in a locked closet. I looked it up, and his picture came up, and it was the same guy. I was dumbfounded. He had gotten custody of his ex-girlfriend's child, no blood relation to him, although... There was another younger boy in the home who was John's biological child. I believe a half-brother. He also had a live-in girlfriend who was no blood relation to either child. The boy was like 30 pounds total when he was found, at seven years old. This poor child was made to use a litter box the last few weeks of his life, kept in a small linen closet, and to think... His stepfather was a cook. If there were money issues, he could have easily taken food from the restaurant. No one would have known. Employees got a free meal each shift. You know, he had, he had so many ways to feed this child. He was sentenced to life in prison. I still think of this poor kid who never had a chance. And about... The guy who hurt him, who was unassuming, friendly but quiet or shy, capable of a job and training others for it. What is wrong with people like him? What made it okay to be like, you deserve this, kid? How could this happen to someone? Or what made an adult truly dislike a child enough to do this? And to convince an adult woman of the same? To not get him help? Wow. Oh. Moral is, I guess you really never can judge a book by its cover. I am in the London, UK, and we are on a tier 4 lockdown. This means that we are supposed to stay in our homes and only go out for essential reasons, such as shopping or exercise. We are not allowed to mix with people outside of our household or support bubble due to the mutating strain of COVID-19 rampaging through London. With hospital beds almost at capacity and the death toll rising, it makes sense to stay indoors as much as possible. But every human being has a breaking point and Mine was eight days after wandering around my one-bedroom apartment. I had talked myself out on Zoom and run out of conversations to have with myself. So, on New Year's Eve at 10pm, I decided to get some air, which is allowed within the rules of Tier 4, and go for a quick walk around the perimeter of the local park, all on main roads. The plan was to stop at a local grocery store and pick up a bottle of red wine on the way back. 
I stepped out with my mask firmly fixed and started walking. One thing I was not prepared for was the eerie, empty, and almost silent streets. Also, it was just below freezing, and so I decided to hustle and cut through some side streets first. On hindsight, this was a big mistake. Navigating myself through very quiet streets, I neared the park when I saw a van. A Mercedes Sprinter size turned in and rapidly approached me. Deciding to let them pass before crossing, I came to a halt. The van began to slow as it approached me. I could see the cab was occupied by two men between 25 and 40 years old. And then it stopped and the window rolled down. One man leaned out and said, Hey friend, we're lost. Can you tell me to XXXX station? The accent was not from the UK and I'm not going to state its origin as I am not going to get into stereotypes. Alarm bells began to ring out immediately. What was a van doing out at this time and my directions to the local train station in the middle of a tier 4 lockdown? The van had stopped so the side door was facing me. I stepped back a few paces and gave directions very quickly. I do not understand at all. I think it's best if you show us. The man replied, opening his door and revealing another two men. I turned and ran down the side street that I had emerged from. Shit, take the van around, I follow him, one of the men shouted. Knowing that these guys were fitter and younger than I was, a foot race to my apartment building was out of the question. The only advantage that I had was a head start and, hopefully, local knowledge of the streets. The side street led to a larger street that had homes all with large hedges. I ran past a few homes and entered the front garden of a house that had the most imposing and opaque hedge. It was unlit, and I ducked down. Lucky for me, that house did not have a motion sensor. Within a few seconds, I could hear footsteps. They went past me and stopped. And I peeked through the hedge vegetation with a very limited view. To see the man who had asked for directions. He was only a few houses down from me and on the opposite side of the street. And he was looking around. Then the sound of a vehicle, I thought, oh no, the van. Lucky for me, it was a car. The man looked at his phone and looked around, pretending to be checking something, and then left the residential street as quickly as possible. The car continued on its way. I waited for another 10 minutes, sitting by the hedge in the front garden, practicing an explanation in case the house lights ever came on, but the house stayed unlit. After the allotted time, I rose quickly and walked back to my apartment building, keeping to the shadows and reacting to every sound. I made it back and bolted the door. Only when I sat down did I understand what I had just avoided. All of this some air and a bottle of red. I poured myself a black coffee and debated calling the police. But what would I say? Had anything really happened to me that they could act on? Intuition of being kidnapped or being in danger is not enough evidence. Plus, being a man, this would not be a priority, especially on a night where they would be overstretched. I just waited in that new year. Realizing that I had a lucky escape and that I should stock up on red wine at a more decent time. The Kuracha. The year was 1994. I was in seventh grade at the time, along with my cousins. Carlos, Chanel, and Shyla. We went to school on Palm Island, but on the holidays, we'd visit my uncle, aunt, and my cousins out near Davenport in the Northern Territory. It was on one of those visits that my story takes place. It was a normal day, pretty much like any other. Me and my cousins, we'd spend our days out in the bush playing Barumba Gimbi and Chubu Chubu. During one of my games, 
My cousin, Carlos, remarked about a set of footprints in the dirt out by the tree line. We investigated then. They were a bit odd, but I thought they must just be an emu, or maybe an ostrich. We do get those out here occasionally, wandering out from the farms. After a tiring day of playing out on the plains, my uncle called us in for Tucker. We had damper and a nice hot stew. After dinner, we just played a bit longer outside. We've got big spotlights outside our place, so it's quite safe for us to play at night until bedtime. My uncles just tell us, don't wander too far and we're all good. So we played another few rounds of Chubu Chubu before we end up getting tired and make our way inside for bedtime. The way that our house out there is set up, we got the living area and the kitchen on the ground floor. There's also a bathroom and toilet down there. Upstairs there's auntie and uncle's room off to the right and my other uncle's room on the left. Down the hall, there's a really big bedroom with bunk beds for all us kids. Back then we had a tally set up in there with a Super Nintendo so we never really got much sleep after we went to bed. We were up late that night, playing games when we hear the dog start barking real loud at the front of the house, around where we were playing earlier. And something else, howling back at the dogs from out bush. Maybe like a dingo or something. We do get dingoes out here, so I quickly run downstairs to grab the dogs and bring them inside. I went outside to grab them and, true God... I've never seen them so scared like they were that night. But anyway, I grab their leads and bring them upstairs with us kids. They were acting real strange, nuzzling in real close with us kids, sitting in front of us, like they were shielding us from someone. That was when I heard my uncles talking from one of the bedrooms. They were real hush about it, but we could hear them from our room. Then, the door handle to us kids' room started turning, and the door slowly opened. It was my uncle and my auntie. As soon as they saw me, they grabbed me by the arm and pulled me up and hugged me. They told me that they saw me go outside, and not to ever do that again at night without asking. They then gestured for us to all follow them into the bedroom up the hall. My auntie and uncle's bedroom, it's got a big window that faces out the front yard. My other uncle was standing there with them and everyone was just staring out there, into the darkness. I was getting pretty scared by this point and I didn't know what was going on. So I asked my other uncle and he just whispered to me, Uncle think could Archer out there. I shivered when I heard him say this. A good archer. It's like a witch doctor. Or kind of like a skinwalker. He's known as the executioner man in our native language. And that's when I remembered those tracks we seen earlier. The one that looked like emu. The old stories we were always told. They tell us about the good archer. And how he wears big emu feather on his feet. Stuck on there with dried blood. We can't really see anything out there in the dark. So my uncle tells one of the kids to run downstairs and turn on the floodlights. My cousin runs downstairs and a minute later the floodlights come on. Right there in the middle of the front yard was a huge looking dingo. That's... Not what scared me that time though, what scared me was the fact that this dingo was standing up on his back legs, the legs all straightened out, thick like a person. On his feet, big thick feathers. He just stared at us right through that window. It took us a few seconds of shock but my uncle quickly shuts the curtains and tells us to get down on the ground. The Kodacha, he got a bone in his hand, 
and my uncle said, no doubt. We stayed there a minute longer. He would have start point the bone at us. Point the bone. It's an ancient ritual in our culture. It is evil magic, and it is forbidden. It's carried out with a long, sharp bone. When it's pointed at your enemies, they die. It might take a week, it might take a year, but they always die. What scares me most about what happened that night, it isn't seeing the thing standing there in the yard, and it wasn't the bone in his hand. Although, I am thankful for my uncle's quick thinking. Nah, what scares me most is thinking back to when we were playing in that yard and walking right over to that dark tree line, looking at those fresh prints. He could have been right there the whole time. And later that night, when I run out to grab the dogs, he was right there near me, looking right at me. I was totally exposed and vulnerable, and I didn't even know it. If you ever make your way to Australia, be careful in the outback. There are unseen things that you don't understand out here, and never could understand. But they see you, clear as day. And some of them, they haven't learned to tell the difference between friend and foe. I, 26 female, have always been fascinated by all things paranormal, but there was a time in my life where I didn't totally believe. I was open to the idea of some sort of paranormal entity existing somewhere, but in my heart didn't really put much stock in it. Over the years, that has drastically changed. Here is one of the encounters that made me a believer. When my wife and I were newly married, we were very close with another couple who lived in our area. We would travel with them, double date with them, and we considered them our best friends. One day they went out of town and asked us to watch their animals for them. They had a cat, a bearded dragon, a red iguana, and two rats. We agreed to watch them, and they left. I worked very close to their home, so I would go over to the house once in the morning once in the afternoon on my lunch break, and then again in the evening. Usually, I would be alone for the morning and afternoon visit due to my job being closest to their home, and then my wife would join me for the evening visit. One day, during my afternoon visit, I purposely left the lights in their home off. They were getting enough natural light through the house to see fairly well without the lights on that day, and I wanted to save them on their electric bill while they were gone. Again, this was a conscious choice to leave their lights off. This was something I actually thought about. I did not touch their lights. After I checked on the animals, I went back to work, again leaving every light switch untouched. When my wife and I arrived back that evening, I froze in the driveway. I could see from where I was standing outside that the entryway and hallway lights were both on. I told my wife, I didn't turn those lights on. I didn't touch them. She asked me if I was sure, and I told her that I was 1000% sure. We thought that maybe someone from their HOA had come by, or one of their family members, or that someone had noticed that they were out of town and broken in. We each put a car key between our knuckles and entered the house. The house was eerily quiet. I couldn't hear any of the animals moving around, and the air felt stale, like... I could have choked on it stale. We slowly made our way through the house, checking closets and looking for any signs of disturbance. Every light was on in every room that we entered. After we had checked every room and absolutely nothing was out of place, we both relaxed somewhat. I even started to gaslight myself into believing that I had somehow turned on every single light in every single room, even the rooms I hadn't entered. Suddenly we hear a loud thud come from the reptile room, the one we had literally just left. The thud was loud enough 
that the house shook. We threw the door open, and nothing was disturbed. Nothing had fallen. Nothing had changed. Nothing had moved. Not an inch. The only thing that had changed was the bearded dragon. The bearded dragon's enclosure was large and positioned on the floor with a sliding glass door front. The dragon, who had been peacefully resting when we checked just a minute before, was now rhythmically tapping its nose against the glass in a perfect pattern. Tap, 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 over and over again. It was almost robotic. I stared in disbelief. I had never seen an animal behave like that before. I walked over to the enclosure and gently slid the glass door open. The dragon continued, trying to tap on the glass, even though it was no longer there for another second or two. And then suddenly, its beard went pitch black. It scrambled out of the enclosure and took off across the floor, headed straight for the door. Luckily, my wife was able to close the door before he escaped. Once he reached the door, he started rhythmically tapping on it the same pattern he had on the glass. Tap, tap, tap. Suddenly, on the other side of the door, we heard another loud thud, even louder than the first one. And in the same second, the cat started screaming. Not meowing, screaming. It was a horrible sound, but I didn't have time to react before I heard clanging and cluttering in the other enclosures behind me. The iguana was wildly whipping its tail against the sides of the enclosure, and almost hissing. It was a horrifying sight. I quickly picked up the bearded dragon and put him back in his enclosure, where he continued tapping immediately, while my wife grabbed for the doorknob. I'll never forget the fear and disbelief in her voice when she said, It won't open. I flew to the door and started yanking as hard as I could. The knob wouldn't even turn. Not like it was broken. Like someone was holding it from the other side. I started banging on the door and screaming true panic setting in. My head felt fuzzy, my chest felt tight, and I almost thought I was going to pass out. Then suddenly, it all stopped. The cat stopped screaming. The iguana stopped whipping. The dragon stopped tapping, and the doorknob was easily moved. When we left that room, the rest of the lights in the house were now off. My wife and I bolted out of the house as fast as we could, and was silent the whole drive home. The next day, I had almost convinced myself that it was a fluke and that the animals had upset each other. I talked to my friend to tell her about the weird experience, to which she replied, Oh, I forgot to mention, we've been having activity in the house lately. What do you mean by activity? I responded, to which she explained that the former resident of her home had been an elderly man that passed away in the home after owning it for 40 years. She told me that ever since they had started their renovations, she had seen a male figure standing in the corners of the home or base of the stairs, that he would rile the animals up, and that he would often mess with the lights in the house. She said he had never been violent, more mischievous, as if he were throwing little fits about the changes they were making. After that, I re-evaluated my whole outlook on my belief in the paranormal. I sure as hell believe now. This was about four or five years ago. Back then, I lived with my mother in a shed on a farm surrounded by woodland. That farmland was part of a larger piece of farmland that was split up and then sold off. So we did have neighbors though they were roughly half a kilometer away each. We loved that though because of the privacy. It wasn't like there was nobody nearby I couldn't go to if I needed help. And that thought is what had me fearlessly walking alone at night between the hours of 7 and 8 p.m., sometimes fluctuating from earlier to later, just depending on the day. Sometimes, I even went back out on a walk at 2 a.m. in the morning because I was restless and just couldn't sleep. Looking back, this was incredibly stupid. And after this incident, I never walked after 6 p.m. ever again, always making sure that there was at least some sunlight left when I set out. The route I always took was a road circuit. The first part was out in the open in front of all the other farms, including my own. 
If anything had happened, at least one person would have noticed and reception was pretty good, so I would have been able to call someone. The second half, on the other hand, was concealed by about 200 meters of woods between the farms and the back road, stretching the full two kilometers at the back of the farm. It was during that part of the walk when I had this creepy encounter. It was late at night. I can't remember exactly what time, but it was pitch black with the exception of my torchlight. I was about to approach the turn in the loop that would bring me out into the open again when I heard it. Help. It was this monotone voice that repeatedly asked for help. It didn't seem panicked in the least. I took my headphones out and turned my music off to make sure that I was hearing it correctly. But it didn't stop. Help. Help. A very stupid part of me almost responded. Because, for some reason, it was my first instinct. It was like the, oh no, someone's in trouble. Like a naive kid even though I would have been like 16 or 17 at the time. Of course, the realistic part of my brain kicked in. I realized that the approaching that voice was just about the stupidest thing I could do, so I started backing away quietly. Unfortunately, my cat had followed me on the walk and wasn't backing away with me. No, she wasn't walking towards the voice, she was softly hissing. I remember desperately trying to get her to come back towards me, without alerting that voice to my presence, just in case they hadn't noticed me yet. But I was getting scared and didn't want to stay there a moment more. So I ran forward, grabbed her, and then turned around and bolted back toward my house. I don't know if it was stupid of me to turn my back to the voice, as I was making so much noise while running that there was no way they didn't know I was there. And I had no way of knowing if they were giving me chase. That whole time I'm f***ing terrified. The image of someone cloaked in shadows chasing me entered my mind. And even though I couldn't hear anyone behind me, I never once slowed down until I was back safe and sound within my house. Doesn't end here though. Despite how terrifying it was, there's still a part of me that was concerned about whoever it was because what if they really did need help? So I asked my mother to drive us out to that location. Another very stupid decision considering what we found. That being nothing. We called out and called out, but nobody answered. We didn't get out of the car. Luckily, neither of us were that stupid. We drove home, having seen nothing and no one. It still bothered me in the morning, so I had my mother drive us down over there again. We searched that immediate area. Nothing. No indication that anyone had been in there. There's no body, which admittedly was a drastic thing to search for, but I know shock can leave you eerily calm, which could have explained the monotone voice. The lack of response afterwards made me fear that we'd been too late and then we'd find a body in the morning. I don't know if I would have preferred this outcome, because then I would have had a face to the voice. But we found nothing at all that day, and to this day, we still have no idea who that voice belonged to, and why they were just casually calling out for help. My mind has naturally come to some chilling conclusions and theories that leave me unable to sleep. I guess I'll never really know for sure. Hey everybody, thanks for listening if you stuck around to this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, you can stalk me on Facebook, and you can also stalk me on Instagram. All these links are below. What's up everybody? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. First and foremost, uh, let's give a big shout out to every single narrator that came on to this episode to help me out and to make this a nice thick with 16 C's episode so that you all could listen, enjoy, and it can insert itself into your ear hole. And here comes a train and you get to listen to it because guess what? As you've heard before, if you're a frequent flyer here in the outros, I don't edit this at all. Because I don't think it's uh, important or, or impertinent or whatever that word is. Pertinent. Is that the word? Pertinent. I don't know. But that's... I'm not doing it. I'm not going to do it. You're just going to have to listen to me ramble. Or you can just exit now and exit stage left and head out and get back to whatever you were doing. And you don't have to listen to this at all. Because uh, most of the time, as you... Uh, anybody who's uh, 
been here before. This is just a lot of rambling, a lot of nonsense, and a lot of idiot talk. Because that's what I tend to do. Grow when you're a grown man child. And you got nothing else to say or do at the end of these. But in all seriousness, thank you so much, all you narrators, for coming over here and helping little old me out. I appreciate it. Real nice. And, uh... I should have another episode out for you on Sunday, and it is going to be something I haven't done in quite a while. So, uh, <clears throat> I appreciate y'all being patient with me, um, and I hope you like these new. Th I hope you like these thumbs, and the new people potentially to come to my channel will as well, because I needed something to stick out. And also, I posted in the community chat the other day about how. Uh, they're going to change, but nothing about my content is going to change. I think <clears throat> moving forward, the true scary stories episodes like this is going to have a little bit of extra rain and stuff on it, onto it, the longer ones like that. But then the rest of them, hold on. <coughs> Good Lord. The rest of them aren't going to have any of that stuff. It's well, I have rain and ambience and stuff like that, but they're only going to be like 20 to 25 minutes max because well i'm not even gonna get into it but that is what's gonna happen um i think i'm finally getting into a rhythm um for the most part it's still not narrowed down wednesday sunday is supposed to be my scheduled days and more more often than not that will be the case but don't hold me to it because that is subject to change okay understood get it do you really understand though do you really understand if you're nodding your head along right now, then thank you. If you're shaking your head left and right, then that's not nice. But, yeah. <clears throat> okay, I'm done rambling. I love y'all. Again, thank you to all the narrators who came on this episode. Y'all the real ones. You're a real OG. Um, I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers. <laughs>